hello everyone. I'm Eva Ioannou and I would like to welcome you in today's demo of the Europe Open Meeting uh, on the latest developments in morphine optimization in ANZO. First, I will start by presenting the latest developments and then I'll proceed with a live demonstration. Now, before starting, I would like to inform you that during the session, all participants are muted and at the end of the session, there will be a five minute slot for Q&A. Uh, the questions can be typed within the Q&A section on the right of your screen and you should address them to all panelists. I will try uh, to answer them all, but if the slot is not enough, I will answer you uh, with uh, an email. So let's start. I would like to start from our new tools that are available under new morph modules. Each tool provides many actions depending on the position of the mouse over an entity. The partition tool enables the creation of new morphs from existing ones, either by offsetting a box from a box face, by joining two boxes, or by splitting a box to smaller ones. Now, depending on the mouse handling, different functions are applied. For example, here you can see that the box is split into smaller ones by a simple click on a morph edge, but if you click and drag from one edge to another, you can perform a split cut. The Adjust tool allows the shape adjustments. For example, you can enlogate existing boxes. You can uh, insert or remove tangency between edges by drag and drop of one edge to another. You can slide a box face. You can import uh, control points that can be later used to change the shape of the edge and many more actions. The Move tool allows the movement of all structural entities of the morphs. So you can grab morph points, edges or hatches and move them either freely or to a specific direction using the interactive coordinate system. Finally, there is the Features tool that allows the direct handling of recognized features by the feature manager, like the relocation, as you can see here, uh, copying them or removing them. Moving on, the cross-section morphing is now quicker and easier. The model can be morphed according to any modifications made on the cross-sections. So here you can see the cross-sections being changed by modifying their height and width and the model being updated to those changes. So here you can see the initial state and here the final. Moreover, it is now possible to change to form the model with interactive handlers and you can extend, taper, twist, or bend it. The users can also modify the cross-sections to be preserved while morphing with form or DFM edge fit. So the default section is normal to the neutral axis. The new user-defined section can be defined either by selecting two nodes, in which case the first acts as origin, or three nodes, which actually will define a plane. Now, the same functionality is also available for the steady section constraint. Now, the steady uh, cross-section entities that were recently added in the DFM edge functionality can now be defined as separate constraints and therefore used in any DFM action. Now, bits and stamps can be created detached from the underlying surface, as you can see here in this region, while the offset and flange width can be specified. Constraints can, constraints can be created massively by selecting the entities or features to be constrained and then you can select if you will create one or more constraints in one step. In addition, the density of the spot wells can now be respected when morphing is applied on a model. Finally, spot well optimization can be performed with equal spacing as you can see here or non-equal distribution. As far as the optimization is concerned, a new RSM tab is added in the optimization tool and response surface models can now be defined from co completed DOE runs. Now, the response surface models are created from machine learning algorithms and a special toolkit needs to be installed in order to have access to them. Now, the, requir the required responses are selected. A name is given for the RSM and the incremental option uh, which is also available allowing to update the RSM with new experiments at a later time. Finally, some information is summarized and the creation of the RSM training starts. 
And when it is done, a new RSM appears in the list. Also, a new optimizer tab is added in the optimization tool, and optimization studies can be defined based on uh, response surface models or directly. So one of the existing RSMs here is selected. The responses can be used in order to define the objective and constraints. Initial design variable values for the optimizer are automatically selected and can be modified if needed. A name and a few settings are defined, and after the confirmation step, the optimization study is finished, is defined. Um, then pressing start will start the optimization. Now, if an optimum is identified, a validation experiment can be created. In the results tab that you can see here, we can see the experiments with blue, uh, the optimization iterations with red, and the green uh, diamond shape is the final validation run that was created by running the optimization task, meaning the pre-processing, the solver, and the post-processing items using the optimum uh, design variable values. Moreover, we have three new DOE algorithms that have been introduced for experiments uh, generation, the optimal lighting hypercube, the symmetric optimal lighting hypercube, and the modified extensible lattice sequence, uh, which are now available for a more efficient design space exploration. Now, the simulated annealing algorithm has expanded the list of the available optimization algorithms. It is able to solve either RSM-based optimization studies, exploiting the state-of-the-art machine learning functionality, or direct optimization studies based on direct connectivity with an EFI solver. The results tab of the tool has a new enhanced layout. Tables and charts can be dragged from uh, the left side of the window and dropped to the area in the right. And this area can also be uh, split into multiple windows to facilitate the parallel overview of the various charts and tables. Moreover, we have a new template that is now available for OptiStrack optimization, guiding a user with less experience uh, in such an analysis setup uh, with the keywords. Uh, also, you can investigate the behavior of the model and optimization study with the creation of new bulkheads. So now we support uh, the creation of uh, bulkheads on U-shaped parts and the creation of triangular ones by selecting a cell region of the model. So then you can uh, parameterize uh, the position of the bulkhead and find an optimization study, uh, the correct position to optimize the behavior of the model. And this is uh, the um, presentation part. And now I can start uh, showing you uh, the um, likely the changes. So what I need to show you first, I will start, I will open this model. I will start with the new uh, morph modules and the new morph tool sets. So if you go to the morph module, you will find an arrow on the right. And if you click it, you will be able to see and find five different uh, modules. So uh, there is a classic morph uh, module where you can find um, all the functions that you know grouped uh, in the same way, uh, while the other four new morph modules are created and um, they have uh, grouped functions that are related to the kind of morphing, morphing that you need to apply to your model. So if you want to apply only direct morphing on your model, then you can switch to this a module where you can find the functions needed only for direct morphing and some additional ones in order to create uh, some utility entities like edge points and etc. The same uh, applies also for the other three uh, modules. So the 3D morph box module has only the functions that are needed in order to handle and morph a model with 3D morph boxes. And the same is for the other two. So let's focus uh, on this one. So the purpose of uh, those new modules is to minimize the time that you need in order to search functions and um, to move the cursor and select uh, many functions. Um, now, the first uh, thing is solved, uh, the, the time to find a function by this new grouping that has only the functions that you need. And the time is uh, reduced with the new uh, tool sets that you can find under the direct edit um, group. So those tools, as uh, I said previously in the presentation, 
uh, incorporate uh, many old functions of the classic uh, morph menu. So let's see how we can use uh, this uh, module and these uh, tools in order to apply some morphing in this on this model. So in this case, I have this member, and what I want to do is change the width of the flanges and make uh, this region a little bit uh, longer, while only those will absorb the morphing. So let's see how you can work uh, with this uh, module and the tools. The first thing that I need to do is to create a new uh, a new box that will include uh, the model. So now I will pick the whole model. I middle click and the box is created. So now we'll use the new tools in order to create the splits and morph uh, the model. I will start by using the partition tool. And as you can see, when I activate it, I can see here a description of what can be done uh, when I hover the mouse over an entity. So for example, if you focus here where it says edges, if I move the cursor over an edge, I can see what I can do uh, if I click, I can split it, or if I drag it, I can uh, split to opposite side. Uh, also, there are some functions that are not directly um, visible, and those can be accessed by uh, hovering over the entity that you want to uh, manipulate, let's say. So we right-click on it and we see uh, now the, um, some other functions that are available in order to uh, work uh, on this edge. So you can either uh, split uh, with a number, split by project, delete uh, the morph uh, box that is under the cursor, or switch between the tools. So uh, now, since I want to perform a very accurate split to morph uh, the flanges, I can either select this option, or since I know the shortcut, which is um, uh, the P from the keyword, I will hover over the edge that I want to split, press the P, and now I am in projection mode. So uh, if I hover over uh, grid, I can see a preview of what is going to be created, the split, and if I click on it, then the split is created. So I do the same on the other side. And now the splits are created. And I am ready to uh, change uh, the width of uh, those flanges. So now I will go to the Move uh, Direct Tool toolset that allows you to move um, edges, hatches, of the boxes and uh, control points. So as I hover over an entity, the um, coordinate system that you can see grayed out um, hovers over and snap on it. So if I come here, it will snap on an edge here on the point. And if I simply drag now the edge, click and drag, I will move freely the entity, the hatch that is highlighted. Uh, since now I want to move uh, in a specific axis, in the X axis, I will simply click on the hatch this coordinate system becomes active, and if I hover over the axis that I want to use, it becomes active, and I drag and morph to the point that I want. Once I do this in the one side, I go also to the other one, and perform the same. Okay, so the next thing that I want to do is change this, uh, this um, distance over here. So I need to create more splits. I will go back to the partition tool. Now I can do it more draftly and say that I want to split here, 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 and here. And now I will move, uh, I will slide those box faces in this direction and those in this in order to change the width and those regions will remain let's say, uh, the same, uh, absorbing the morphing. So I will now use the adjust tool set. Again, here you can see a description of what you can do. So what I need to do here is hover over the box face that I want to slide, uh, press the control button, click on it, and select also the neighboring ones. And I will start sliding to morph the model. So I, can, I want to morph by an exact value. I will press the space bar and enter a specific value. And then I will do the same on the other side. Again. Okay. So this is uh, how easily and quickly I can uh, change now uh, and morph uh, this model with a new 
uh, Morph uh, module and the new tool sets. I will continue with the next demonstration. which is how you can uh, change the cross-sections of uh, your model and update it, update it quickly with uh, direct morphing. So here what you can see is some cross-sections that are created from the direct morph loft functionality. If I switch to the direct morph module, I can find it under create loft. And uh, I create these cross-sections and I can change them, morph them, and then uh, quickly update the FN model. So let's see now what we have uh, stored here. So first I will demonstrate what you can do and then how you can do it. So I will come here, I have saved the morph parameter and I will change the height of uh, those cross-sections in order to apply a change on them. So I will reduce the height. And another thing that I can do is uh, come here and change the radius of uh, those entities, which are called PM loft entities and are create PM. I'm sorry, PM arc entities, and are created automatically with the PM loft entities. And I can come here, select them, see the radius, and change it here. And then also those fillets will be uh, morphed and um, updated to match the new cross sections. So here I will enter a value of six. And so far, what I've done is that I've only changed the shape of the cross-sections. What is left to do is go to the PM loft uh, entity and pick the geometry update function. So if I uh, come a little bit closer, you can notice here the difference and also in the fillets. And let's see now how you can do that. So I will open uh, a file, the same file with other entities. Okay. So I need to go to create loft wrap function. I need to make sure that the option here under loft uh, geometry is load visible. But I don't want to create new geometry. I simply want to create those entities to be able to change the cross sections and update the model. So as I move the cursor over the model, I'm able to see uh, the cross section that will be created. So uh, let's say that I want to start influencing um, this region over here to change it. So here I want to create some cross sections that I can change them and the uh, changes uh, can be applied then on the model. So I middle click. And if I go to the database browser, I will be able to see that a PM loft entity was created automatically. And also those PM arc entities. So um, to make uh, this a bit quicker, I will show you only the update again of the radius over here, how you can do it. So you can select the PM loft entities, change them from this field. No change is applied yet. I go to the PM loft and select to update the model. And this is how easily you can uh, modify the model having cross sections. The, new the next example has to do with the form function and uh, the new options that you can find uh, within the tool. So I go to direct morph module, morph form, uh, the function is activated. I pick all the entities that I want to be influenced to be formed. I middle click and now I can see those handlers that allow um, to easily change uh, the shape of uh, this model. So let's uh, start by showing the bend functionality. So as I hover over the axis uh, of this uh, interactive coordinate system, I can see uh, a preview of what can be done. Also, I want to apply ch the changes in both ends. So I will also synchronize those uh, coordinate systems and I will click and drag in order to bend the model. So the bending is done. 
let's see also some other options over here. So I can change the taper in this and this direction. I can twist it and I can elongate it. And this is how you can apply those changes uh, very quick and uh, easily with a form function. Moving on to the next example. So in the latest versions, we've added in the DFM edge fit uh, function uh, a step that is called steady section entities. So this uh, step allows to select an area that you need to retain its cross-section during DFM edge fit. So let's see what you could do before and what you can do now. We have stored some parameters so you can see first what's the difference. So here I have this edge. Uh, this uh, curve, that is the middle curve of the cylinder, but I want to fit it in this one. And all of the cylinder is the morphed area. So if I morph it, you will see that the cross-section of the cylinder is not uh, retained. So in order to fix this, we added a step with the steady section entities. And if you uh, select them, then during this morphing, the cross-section of the cylinder is retained. So, uh, of course, uh, this uh, functionality was very useful and could be used in other DFM actions. And this is why we created a constraint, um, a steady section constraint to be used in another DFM action. So, in order to create this constraint, I go to Setup, Constraints. I pick the Steady Section option. And here I need to define which entities uh, will uh, retain the section. So I will pick the FE entities. I select the whole tube. I have to pick the neutral line where the cross section uh, um, will be retained. That passes through the neutral line. I will switch to curves, pick the curve. And this is the cross section uh, that will be retained uh, on the neutral line. I don't have any transition entities or any fixed entities. So now the entity is created and can be found under the morph constraints. This is the old one and this is the one that we just made. So uh, I want to use this now. Uh, here I have a NetSuite function so I can see how you can use it as uh, a constraint. So I will select to morph with the FM. I select the edge fit option, pick the source edge and the target one. I select the whole tube as morphed entities. And since I've picked uh, entities of the tube, uh, the steady section uh, constraint appears in the list of the available constraints. I select to include it in this morphing. And then uh, when I apply the morphing, the cross-section is retained. So this is how you can create this constraint and select it in a DFM action. Now, uh, as uh, I've mentioned briefly uh, before, um, when we perform a form action, uh, like tree taper extend or we use the steady section entities uh, there are those entities are uh, retain the cross-section uh, that is uh, defined automatically by the selecting dead entities so when I pick the form entities and confirm you can see uh, that if I click the adjust there is a neutral line that passes through the selected entities and the cross-section that is uh, um, retained during morphing is the one that is normal uh, to this um, vector, let's say. So in order to see this, I can uh, activate this box and I can see the default cross-section that is being retained. If I want to change this for some reason, I can si simply come here and select to define a new one. Uh, the first point will define the origin and the second, the direction, or I can pick uh, three points to define a plane. 
So once I define the plane, I just confirm, and this is the new cross-section that is going to be uh, retained during morphing. Um, the next example is the detached features or new parts that you can create uh, when you go to the features create function. So if uh, we come here, we have the create features uh, function that allows to create um, those features. I will pick the bit option and I want to create a part that looks like a straight rounded bit. So I pick two points. Can uh, change here uh, the shape. Okay. And once I've defined um, the bit shape, let's say the characteristics, I can activate this detached feature in order to be able to detach this and create flanges that will be offset from the underlying surface. So I come here, press the button and I enter a value for the flanges. So if I close this, you can see uh, that the preview has no flanges. If I activate it, then I can see uh, the preview of the flanges. So here I can enter a value. The preview is updated. And I can also enter a value for the offset distance. So the, the whole part is offset from the underlying surface according to this uh, value. So here you can see how it's being moved away from the underlying surface. So once I, I'm okay with the distance, the plant is in the characteristics, I middle click or press next, finish, and a new part is created and offset from the underlying surface according to the value that I gave. The next example is uh, how you can uh, use uh, uh, an option of the constraints definition window in order to define uh, multiple constraints in one step. So if you go to the new um, direct morph module under setup constraints and rigid, I activate a constraint that I want to apply. And then I can pick area, nodes, on the FNDT or geometry or features, um, select them massively, and then um, select what I'm going to do with the generation of the constraints. So I will pick now the features option. I have recognized holes on the model. So here I can see the holes, the features that I pick. And here I have the option of what I want to do. So I can either uh, create one constraint for each of those areas that I picked, or create one that will include all of the areas. In this case, I will create uh, one constraint for each of the areas. I will press next. I will add some transition uh, area. Uh, keep the identified uh, fixed lines. And if I go to the database browser and open the morph constraint list, I will find uh, the three uh, different constraints that were created automatically. The next thing that we're going to see is how you can retain the density of spot welds while you apply direct morphing on your model. So uh, let's see uh, here uh, in a parameter how we respect the density. So we've saved the parameter that changes the length of this uh, member here. So I will apply morphing and I want you to notice uh, all the connections that have been selected in the DFM morphing action and how uh, new ones will uh, appear here while I change the length of uh, this part. So you can uh, notice it from the different color over here that uh, is the color of not uh, selected entities that new connections appear in order to retain the density. So here we have those two. 
And um, in order to do that, you need to define some entities that are called connection chains. And then you simply select uh, the spot welds in your morph action and there's nothing more to do. So uh, if the connection chain is selected, the entities are selected in the direct action, then the spot weld density will be respected. So in order to do that, let's open. Okay, let me first delete the ones that I have already. We'll delete also this. Okay, so uh, in order to define a connection chain, I can go to setup and pick the spot well groups button. Okay, and here I can define a new chain. So there are uh, different ways to do that. You can either create one by picking one by one the spot welds. You can box select, or you can uh, identify them automatically. Uh, this identifies the chains depending on the density, the connectivity, and um, the distance between the spot welds. So now we'll pick the box selection. To demonstrate this, I am picking the connection points that I want to control the density. Middle click. And now I can see that a new connection chain is added under the list. I can see that all of those uh, spot wells are connected somehow. And uh, what I need to do now in order to include uh, this, this chain in the DFM, as I said, is simply select the spot wells, either as control entities or morphed. Another thing that I can do besides including them in DFM morphing, is change the density directly using this connection chain. So besides morphing um, a member, for example, in this case, I can select to apply specific design actions on this connection chain. So I can change the density by a factor. So here you can see them uh, being increased by a factor of 1.5. I can set the specific number of spots or I can apply a specific spacing. So I can apply uh, any of those changes directly uh, from uh, this uh, window over here. The other thing that I can do uh, is also parameterize uh, the density. So at this point, uh, when I've picked, uh, for example, to modify and give a specific number of spots, I can parameterize the number of spots for an optimization study. So I go to save and pick the as design variable option. Here I can see that I've changed, uh, I have selected to change the density uh, according to a specific number of connections. And if I want to apply equal spacing or not, click OK. I define uh, the design variable minimum and maximum values. So, And now if I go to the optimization tool, I will find the parameter that controls that controls this uh, connection chain. And if I apply a different current value as an optimizer, let's say 30, and run this, then uh, the spot words are changed to 30 with equal spacing. And this is how you can include the density of spot welds in a DFM action, how you can simply change the density or even parameterize it. So the next thing uh, is the generation of uh, different types of bulk kits. So I will go to the plugins tool, uh, select the Bulky tool. Okay. And in this case, the new types are the U shape and the triangular one. So the U shape demands to have um, this kind of uh, profile in order to work a U shape, as you can see here. Uh, you pick the property. 
either direction to the flanges, maybe an offset distance and so on. Uh, create a DFM translate parameter to parameterize the position of the bulkhead, create spot lines. And finally, uh, create uh, the bulkhead on the U-shaped profile. The other option is to create a triangular bulkhead. So in this case, I have to pick uh, the cells where I'm going to create uh, this uh, bulkhead, the region. Give the direction grids for the flanges. And uh, get the new triangular bulkhead. Also, uh, if I go to the parameters, I can see the created uh, parameter that allows a change in position. Now let's move on to see the uh, new uh, options of the optimization tool. I will close this one. Okay. So I will work with this model. This model, this model already has some parameters defined. Uh, we also have uh, a workflow setup here. So we have some design variables that change uh, the thicknesses of parts. Uh, we apply, we apply some connections. We calculate the mass and uh, create the solver input file. So. Uh, the first thing that I need to do in order to be able to have access to the RSM uh, um, and run the RSM models is to define uh, the DM path uh, in order to save the experiments uh, in the DM directory. So I come here and if I don't have any uh, DM paths, I can define a new one, select, for example, a folder, an empty folder. And if I open it, I will use um, uh, that directory as a DM directory for the optimization. So in this case, I will use this one. I then open the optimization tool. Uh, the next important thing is to uh, change uh, this from working directory to save in DM. And then I am ready to create uh, the post-processing item in order to run then a baseline run and check that my process is uh, uh, correctly set up. So I will come here and select to add a post-processing item. I need to give uh, the session file that will be used to extract the responses. Um, now uh, I need to point out here that this session file does not um, is not generated in the same way as we did for the DOE uh, studies, uh, but this is documented. We will not see this uh, right now. And the next thing that I need to give is the output directory, which needs to be the DM directory. So I click OK, and now uh, the task is set up, and I am ready to run it and check if everything is OK. So I click on baseline run. OK, so everything finished uh, successfully and also the responses were extracted by meta and read uh, through the session file to the session results file um, under the responses of ANSA and meta. So once I've checked this, I go to the DOE setup uh, tab and I'm ready to uh, generate the DOE experiments, which will then be used to train uh, the RSM models. So I will come here, I will pick one of the new um, algorithms for the DOE, and I set up the designs that need to be set in order to uh, generate um, the experiments. So you need to have at least 10, and of course, as many as you have, the better it is. So I will, uh, for example, select 25 and to generate all uh, the uh, experiments. So now the experiments are created, and the next thing that I need to do is pick the start button, which um, opens this window. So uh, before starting the DOE, we need to define 
uh, a signature for this uh, DOE study, which means that it um, needs to have a name and some identification number um, for the DM. Uh, so here you can pick the discipline, whatever uh, you want here to set the project name, the release and so on, and go to the next uh, page. So here, what we see is that we have executed the baseline run, we did it before, and we have checked that the process is okay. If we didn't run before the baseline run, we could do it uh, from here uh, in order to make sure that uh, the DOE will run normally. So everything is okay. I will press the next button. Here we're trying to find if there are any uh, conflicts with the names of the simulation models that exist in the DM. And if they are, then you can uh, you have uh, an option to uh, include a new simulation model and so on. And here we check for simulation run conflicts, for conflicts that are related with the DOE studies table. Uh, we check the name, uh, the experiments, and so on. So here we don't have any conflicts. And if I click finish, then uh, we will, uh, the DOE study will start and uh, I will wait for the results. So I will not do this right now because it will take time to run those experiments, but I will open directly one that we have run before. So I'm opening this one. Again, I need to set up the correct uh, DM path. I will remove this one. Okay, and select the new DM path. So um, the optimization tool can read all the results. So I will open the tool. Here I have uh, the DOE study that I've run. And once the DOE is finished, you can go to the RSM setup tab. So here you can see that I have already run one. Uh, and here you can see some very basic info. And let's see how you can do that. So in order to create a new response surface model, you can pick this button and set up some things. So you can select uh, the analysis that you want to run. This is the, the name of the optimization task. So you want to run this task. Uh, next. And then you need to pick the responses um, that um, new RSM will be, uh, new RSM models will be created. So I will pick all of them. Here you need to give a name to your uh, RSM models. and select at this step if it's going to be incremental or not. So this means that if you select to be incremental, you can come um, at a later point, at a later stage of your uh, process and add more experiments to the um, uh, DOE study that you've run and include this in the response surface models. So if you activate this, you will have this option. Here there's a confirmation and if I press start, then uh, the response surface models will be trained. And once it's finished, I will be able to uh, see them listed over here. Uh, so if, for example, you want to add uh, more DOE uh, experiments, you can pick the incremental button to add them. And you can select to retrain the RSM models uh, with the old and the new experiments together to have a better accuracy. Although uh, running only the new ones uh, is faster. So let's see also what you can see, what more info you can find on the RSM models. If you go to the DM browser and go to the predictors, uh, you'll be able to find all the resp response surface models. So let's see what uh, lies under each of those uh, response surface models. So here we have some uh, tables that uh, we generate automatically in order to check the accuracy of the prediction of the RSM models. So MetaViewer opens, so we can see those uh, charts. So there are uh, five different uh, plots that show uh, the uh, prediction accuracy, but what is uh, very important is this one, which shows the sensitivity 
um, of the result of the response of the mass response depending on the design variable so here i can see that the mass is influenced more from those uh, two design variables than uh, the other two that i have in my uh, optimization task also you can find uh, the mean absolute error over here of uh, each of the uh, responses and uh, you have this overview through the dm browser Okay, so once you've uh, finished with the RSM models, you can go to the Optimizer tab and create a new optimization study. So if you see here, I have already some optimization studies defined and some have already run. So let's see how you can uh, set up a new optimization study. I press the button. Uh, I have to set up some information, for example, the name of the optimization Uh, if I want to change the number of iteration and uh, uh, this info over here. So if I want to use the IP opt algorithm, I can do it, but uh, this um, uh, is used only uh, on the response FS models, or I can pick the simulated annealing algorithm that uh, can be used either for the with the RSM models or directly uh, as a solver. So I will select this one and then I can set up the convergence, tolerance and the max iterations of the optimization study. Again, we are searching for conflicts uh, depending on the analysis and the name of the simulation run um, within the DM. So here we don't have any conflicts. We go to the next step and we select the responses that will be used during the optimization. Here we can define from the selected responses which is going to be the constraint, which is the objective. So I will pick here, for example, this, and uh, have as an objective to minimize the mass. Here I can see the initial values of the, of the design variables. So those values are selected from the DOE experiment that uh, had as a result uh, the, um, the minimized mass. So um, we take the best experiment from the DOE studies and start from those values for the design variables. Of course, if I don't want to use them, I can come here and change them. Uh, I, you can change them from here. Finally, you see a confirmation step. You press finish and this uh, study is added under the contents list and how you have an overview of what you have selected in order to run this you pick the start button and the optimization will run again i will not run this now because it will take time but uh, we'll go and see uh, if you had the results how you could uh, see them and manipulate them in the results tab. So here you can see the new layout. Uh, we have here the options of the charts. Uh, you can change the layout from uh, and see more than one windows. Here I will select to create two and I will add a chart of uh, the results. So I pick the DOE study that I want to create a chart from. Select the, select the type of chart. I want to see the experiments uh, and the mass for each experiment. And here I can see um, the mass uh, for each experiment. The last one is the optimum one. So if you use um, the, uh, the algorithms on the RSM models, then you will either see as a last value, uh, the value the, the, that was find as optimum from the response surface model, from the optimizer, uh, you can either see the validation result, as I said before, if you run optimization on the RSM, you will uh, be prompt to run a validation run and check that indeed the prediction is correct and uh, uh, what uh, you think is the best value. So you can either see here the validation run result or uh, the optimum uh, value uh, that came from the direct optimization. Okay, so um, this is what is new in the latest versions. Uh, 